you all have cannolis in your lunch? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry. That may be just for the members of the panel. I shouldn't have revealed that. Um, we're very um, uh, both happy and honored to have Dr. Tevi Troy as our luncheon speaker, uh, former uh, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, um, extensive experience in the White House serving in several high-level positions, uh, author, uh, including of um, his uh, recent book on when to, when to Wake the President, fascinating book with a really moving introduction in it <laughs> by me. <laughs> and uh, most important of all, an ex officio member of this panel and he's, we're, in which he role he's contributed a lot. So, uh, Tebby, it's great to have you uh, here. We'll try not to be too brutal in our cross-examination of you but we would now welcome an opening statement. Looks like it's on, but it doesn't sound like it's on. <laughs> oh, no, the, there you go. Oh, why don't you grab the other one? Why don't you try the other one? Just to, uh, the other one over there, just grab it. It is a great start, just exactly how I envisioned it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Governor, the rest of uh, members of the panel. Uh, I come here today uh, grateful and somewhat humble uh, because I've learned so much from all of you about this issue, both in government and subsequent to government, uh, not just the people big, there at the big table, but also my good ex officio friends at what we call the kids' table. Uh, Rachel is here today uh, holding up the, the fort, but also uh, Scooter Libby and Yona Alexander. Alexander, who couldn't be here today. Uh, but I, I don't want to overdo it on the humble front because the late Golda Meir once said, don't be humble, you're not that great. So I will just, <laughs> I will just leave it there. <laughs> but I do want to speak to you today about uh, my book, which uh, Senator Lieberman did indeed uh, contribute the uh, great forward to, and which Governor Ridge uh -huh. contributed an excellent blurb to. Uh, the book uh, is called Shall We Wake the President? And it lists a whole bunch of threats that presidents face and how presidents have reacted to them in history, but also how presidents should react going forward as policy suggestions. And of all the issues I talk about, the one that I worry about the most is the biological threat. I say biological and not bioterror because as we all know, there's a natural pathogen concern as well. But people were to ask me why in general, I am most concerned about the, the biological threat. One reason is because I used to be the deputy secretary at HHS and I would get briefings in a SCIF, a secure conference facility, uh, where they would tell me things that would make your hair fall out. And uh, in my case, much of it did. But um, <laughs> It was uh, terrifying to hear what some of the threats are that are out there. And perhaps I do, as one of the previous panelists suggested, sleep better at night not hearing those briefings regularly. But just because I'm not hearing them regularly doesn't mean that the threats aren't still there. So that is the overarching reason. But I want to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the concerns I have on this threat. Uh, number one is if you look at the bioterror aspect of it specifically, a concern I have is that we have people with intent to do harm. This is one of, some, one of the things I used to hear about in, in the SCIF, but we know about it from public sources. ISIS, for example, had a captured laptop, and the laptop in, indicated that they had plans to try and weaponize plague. Now, I'm not that concerned about plague per se, because I think it could be addressed with uh, antibiotics today. But if they're looking to weaponize pathogens, that, that is a problem. And we just saw in New York this week that they have the capability of taking people who are here and radicalizing them while they're here and getting them to do terrible things. And the, the person in New York uh, rented a truck. But what if somebody was radicalized who works in a, in a biological facility? So that, that is a concern. Another concern I have is that it's very hard to defend and very hard to detect. You can't see the pathogens. And what I did in my study of history is I found that in previous instances of what you could call biological attacks, so I looked at the 
attempt by German agents to infect American horses with glanders in World War I so that we couldn't use them in the cavalry. I looked at the uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh in Dallas, Oregon in the 1980s when they tried to poison salad bars with salmonella so that they could win a local election. And then obviously there was the anthrax attacks of 2001. In all of those cases, the, uh, the threat was either not detected at the time, certainly not in um, the World War I situation, the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, we only found out about it uh, because the people who were the perpetrators admitted it a year later. There was definitely illnesses going on in Dallas, but people didn't know what had happened until the, uh, the perpetrators admitted it. And then with the anthrax attacks, we never definitively identified the culprit, although we, we think we did, the person uh, who of interest uh, committed suicide before being arrested. So uh, th this inability to detect these things in advance or to identify who is doing it is in another concern that I have. The other problem that I worry about is the uh, potentially devastating consequences. We've talked in this panel about the uh, dark winter exercise that found that a million people would die in case of a major biological attack and that we would only have that vaccine at the time for about 5% of the population. Uh, the NSC also did a study back in the Obama administration that found that such a, an attack would cost hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, kill um, hundreds of thousands of people. So uh, very, very significant dangers. And it's not just remote exercises or uh, tabulations by people at tabletop exercises that tell you this. We've seen in our history some really problematic examples. One thing I talk about extensively in my book is the 1918 flu. Uh, it was not a uh, biological attack, but it was a pathogen. 675,000 Americans died, perhaps as many 50 million died around the world. And what I found in my book is that President Wilson really did not stand up and do what needed to be done in that situation. Now, one of the themes of my book is that the expectations on presidents have significantly changed at the time. So uh, there's a limit to how much blame you can put on someone 100 years ago when the expectations were so different. Um, I talk about how in the 19th century, presidents, because of lack of communication, often didn't even know about disasters that were taking place. In 1811, there was an earthquake in Missouri. And President Madison was in charge at the time, and he didn't really know about the extent of the damage for six weeks. So what's he going to do at six weeks after finding out what, what the problems are? And so it's not like today where you have the immediacy of modern communications. It's also there was not a constitutional expectation that presidents would get involved in these disasters. But over time, that ex that ex uh, the expectation has shifted to the point now where we do expect the presidents to be involved. And so I would hope if something like uh, the flu situation happened, we, we would respond better. Also, you had the Ebola situation in 2014. Uh, fortunately, it didn't cause that many deaths, but it certainly caused a lot of panic. And a lot of the promises of the public health community that we could control Ebola and that it wouldn't spread person to person here in the US were found to be not accurate, now, in part because they didn't follow proper procedures. Uh, and again, it didn't spiral out of control, but there was a lot of panic about Ebola. And if there were a more intense situation, the panic would obviously be a lot worse. I also did a, um, a kind of intensive look at what would happen uh, in a some kind of attack in New York City. And I found that New York City was particularly vulnerable, not, because, not only because it has been the target of um, a, a large number of the terrorist uh, attacks that we've seen in the US, or the terrorist attempts that we've seen in the, in the US, including the, the attack this week, but also because it's, uh, I think, uniquely a hard city to get um, a proper response in. Uh, 300 square miles, five uh, large boroughs, uh, 62 hospitals, 150 different languages. So it's, it's very spread out. It's hard to, for the first responders to, to uh, uh, interact. But also because uh, there's 240 skyscrapers in New York City. That's uh, almost two and a half as many times as many in Chicago. And one of the problems we know that terrorists face in trying to uh, perpetrate a biological attack is the, disper the dispersal issue the dispersal issue, that um, you could put something out there and the wind can take it and then um, it loses its effectiveness. But in a skyscraper, if you can get into the ventilation system, there are potentially thousands of people at risk. And we know there are 50,000 people 
in the towers at 9-11. Uh, fortunately, most of them got out, but obviously, tragically, a, um, about 3,000 of them did not. So uh, the, the skyscrapers are something that I, that I worry about. And I know we've put more attention to looking at the ventilation systems, but, it, but it, you know, all, all you need is one to be vulnerable. So those are some of the problems as I see it. But I also think that we have some important tools. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I think presidential attention is an important tool. I think if a president focuses on something, he can move the government and break through those si silos that, uh, uh, Senator Daschle, you were complaining about uh, rightly earlier, uh, that um, you know, these silos are hard and they're hard to break through. But uh, I think presidential attention is one of the, the, the abilities, one of the tools we have to get through it. Uh, I also think that uh, there are some structural issues we've talked about in terms of uh, having some kind of unified budget, uh, having uh, some point person we suggested the vice president, but perhaps there are other ways to do it, as, as we heard about earlier, uh, having a better procurement system. Uh, you know, I was encouraged by uh, Admiral Zemer, not just by what he said here, but what he said in the room privately. Uh, he said when he got this new job, uh, he wanted to, us to or guess, or he, he said, do you know what the first book I read after getting this appointment? And there was a pause, and I initially was hoping that he'd say, shall we wake the president? Uh, uh, but in, he did not say that, but he did say the second best answer, which was the Blue Ribbon Study pa Panels uh, book that we put out uh, about a year ago. And uh, I was very encouraged of that, and he said he heavily marked it up. And so I think that's not only good news, but I think it really vindicates the work that we've been doing here, that we put a lot of thought into how to address these issues and that people who are now in positions of power are reading that. So I, I think that's encouraging as well. I think we do need to focus on prioritization. There are obviously dozens of potentially dangerous pathogens, but we know, uh, and you can't defend against them all, but we know the certain ones that are bigger dangers, and I think we need to focus on that. One concern I have had that I mentioned earlier in our private session is that we identified Ebola as a threat in 2001. And we also had NIH report positive trials of a vaccine in monkeys also in 2001. Well, 2014 came around and we didn't seem prepared and we didn't have that vaccine ready. So uh, I think when we identify the threats, we need to act on it and improve our procurement system so that we get the, the, uh, the, the response is the countermeasures ready at the appropriate time. Another concern I have is about distribution. I think we have an SS, SNS, a strategic national stockpile. We've spent $7 billion on it, about 500, billion, 500 million annually to maintain it. And it's very good at what it does. But what it does is it gets stuff within 24 hours, countermeasures within 24 hours to a generalized location. And the distribution of the countermeasures to the individuals from that generalized location is up to the states and locals. And we know that there are variations between state and local, uh, among state and locals about how good they are. We saw this recently in FEMA's responses to Hurricane Harvey and then Hurricane Maria. Uh, Texas is very good at its homeland, state homeland security response and they were able to distribute materials. In Puerto Rico, it's just a much tougher, tougher situation, not just because of the lack of roads, not just because of the fact that it's, it's, it's an island and it's more remote, but the homeland security operation in Puerto Rico is just not as robust as that of, let's say, Texas or Florida. So there are state and local variations that we need to be aware of. On distribution, I think we need to be looking at more options. I know we've looked at postal in the past. Uh, there's the pod approach, the, uh, the point of distribution, which works for many people, but uh, you have to worry about people who um, who are older or have disabilities who may not be able to reach that distribution point. Uh, I also think we need to partner more with the private sector on this. I think the, uh, the private sector in terms of um, uh, distribution companies, vaccine companies, for example, know how to guard vaccines. They know how to maintain the proper temperatures and then they know how to distribute it. And so I think we should work closely with the private sector to get that uh, taken about. And then there are new innovations like drones that can deliver things to individuals at a relatively low cost and, uh, in a particularly safe way. Uh, I mentioned the state and locals. I think uh, we need close partnership with them because if the states and locals don't do their job, the federal government can do a great job and it won't necessarily solve the problem in large part because of distribution. But also you look at a place like New York City and I mentioned some of the 
concerns I have about New York City, and I do have some, but I also know that New York City is doing a tremendous job in preparing for these kinds of things. Not only does it have its own intelligence unit, uh, which unfortunately it had to develop because the CIA would not share intelligence with New York on a timely basis, but uh, in addition to the intelligence unit, it has a very active public health department that has done tabletop exercises, that has done distribution run-throughs, that knows how to get things to the people of the city should something bad happen. And uh, uh, so I, I'm encouraged by that. I'm not sure every other place uh, is as effective. I, I look at uh, the Washington Metro, for example, and I'm not even sure they can run the red line, let alone get things to where people need them at times. So, uh, so I think the, the variation is, is an issue. Um, and then there's individuals, and I think individuals have an important role to play. Um, uh, we talked when I was in the Bush administration about med kits, allowing people to purchase uh, some kind of kit that could allow them to deal with some kind of outbreak. You could only use this in case of an outbreak and directed by a public health official. Uh, there was some resistance from the, uh, the, the public health community on this, but I think it's something that, that's worth exploring. Uh, I think uh, um, hygiene is important, um, having a family plan, uh, vaccines are important. I think people should take vaccines and some of the vaccine hysteria is something that, that disturbs me. Uh, social distancing is something that uh, has been effective in certain cases. In fact, in the 1918 flu, Philadelphia and St. Louis, which were cities of comparable populations, uh, St. Louis instituted social distancing to prevent that flu spreading. Philadelphia didn't, and St. Louis ended up with a, a death rate about one-fifth that of Philadelphia. So there are a number of tools we have in the, in the toolbox, and I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure we use those tools. And in closing, I'm just reminded of the story of the pious but poor man who is asking the Lord for help and says, Lord, Lord, can I please win the lottery? Can I please win the lottery? And after multiple weeks of not winning the lottery, he begs the Lord. He says, Lord, I've been a pious man my whole life. Why can't I ever win the lottery? And the Lord's voice booms down and says, help me out, buy a ticket. <laughs> well, these tools are our ticket, and we should buy them. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Gave you a couple of good stories there. That one and the gold of my airline. Uh, I saw you writing that down. You're going to use yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I may uh, give you credit the first time I use it. <laughs> um, that was very helpful. So uh, uh, from your book, uh, talk a little more about... Um, of why you respectfully are critical of President Woodrow Wilson's leadership during the Spanish flu uh, uh, pandemic, which, again, everybody knows, but it's the 100th anniversary next year. An enormous number of deaths be, uh, worldwide beyond what uh, most people imagine. And uh, so what, 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 uh, uh, giving him some mercy because it was a different time, what, what didn't he do? And uh, 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 what lessons can we draw from his less than uh, adequate leadership at that time. Yeah, I identified two specific things in the book that I found problematic. Number one was, this was called the Spanish flu, but it yeah. did not originate in Spain. It actually originated in Kansas at one of the military bases. And it became apparent that the U.S. military transports that were taking American soldiers to fight in World War I across the Atlantic were were grounds for spreading these this disease and it was spreading it among the soldiers themselves but also among the people of Europe you know, I said 675,000 Americans died um, the total number of American deaths in World War I was 116,000 so six times as many died from flu but also 43,000 of the American soldiers who died died from flu so it was a significant component of, of the military deaths anyway it became apparent that the troop transports were spreading the disease and Wilson was warned about this by his Navy doctor. There was a meeting in the White House where the guy who is now the equivalent of the Army Chief of Staff vociferously ex objected to this idea of stopping the troop transports, and Wilson acceded to his request, but uh, kind of looked down afterwards and uh, uh, said a little um, depressing ditty that was said at, at the time about a, a little bird named Enza out flew the window and became influenza. So he, he knew that he was beaten, and he kind of knew that he was wrong, but he allowed this to go forward. And this was in October of 1918, one month before hostilities ended. And so it really wasn't that necessary to maintain uh, the, the troop transports at that rate, and I think they could have done something to solve it there. The other thing was... Um, 
there was a um, a committee on uh, public integrity. It was a um, it was, it was basically a propaganda arm of the Wilson administration that was supposed to uh, promote happy talk, um, focus all effort on winning the war, uh, diminish talk about depressing subjects like the flu. And by not talking about it, I think the American people lost the ability to share strategies like this thing I was telling about with, between Philadelphia and, and St. Louis. And so by having this kind of propaganda arm, and again, I recognize it was a different time, I think he minimized the cross-country communication that could have helped alleviate some of, of the issues there. Okay. Um, let me just ask one to d develop one more idea you mentioned. Um, let's posit a, a scenario where uh, there is the beginning of the spread of an infectious disease. Well, the, the Chinese flu that uh, Admiral Zimmer talked about, let's say it begins to spread. And I know you're, you're focused, and I think quite compellingly, on uh, uh, when the president should be engaged, because ultimate leader, commander in chief. So, wh what are the rules f for this? If this, let's say it happen, it began to happen again. Uh, wh what, who should uh, bring President Trump into it, and uh, when? That, that's an excellent question, and it is something I, I do look at uh, a fair bit in the book. Uh, one of the things that I'm talking about, first of all, is making sure that we prioritize among what the disasters are. And I think that, uh, frankly, we've spent too much time uh, looking at how presidents respond to weather disasters. And I think we should kind of ratchet down presidential attention to weather disasters, but ratchet up presidential attention to things like these biological threats that are, that are more existential threats to us and, and more dangerous to our ability to survive as, as a people and as a nation. But within that context, once a, an issue is, uh, I've looked at this issue, uh, you know, the, the title, Shall We Wake the President, mm -hmm. actually looked specifically at this issue of when presidents have been awakened. There is a process for awakening presidents, and it seems that the, um, uh, as you know, the um, uh, there's constant monitoring in the Situation Room of the National Security Council of what's going on around the world. Uh, the duty officer at the National Security Council would then notify the um, either the National Security Advisor and or the Chief of Staff, and then they make the decision about when to wake the president. So that's a, a specific wake up. But this kind of situation where there's a, a disease raging is not a kind of middle of the night wake up uh, situation. I think as soon as it appears to uh, have the twin dangers of uh, high mortality rate plus person-to-person -person transmissibility, those are the things right. that you start to look at. And when those things develop, I think the uh, people in, let's say, Admiral Zemer's position should be notifying uh, Tom Bossert and should be notifying General McMaster uh, when there's a danger of spreading to the United States or going out of control abroad. I think that's when you should notify the president. I think in the Ebola situation, for example, I think the Obama administration ended up doing a solid job once they appointed the uh, coordinator. I know we've had him come speak before us. Uh, but until then, there was a sense that they didn't really have a coherent strategy, and they didn't know what they were doing. So I think uh, getting on this earlier rather than later is a, a, a best approach. Okay. It's very helpful. Governor. Yeah. When you look uh, historically at multiple presidents, which, sorry. You look back historically at multiple presidents uh, dealing with a variety of crisis situations, <clears throat> and we often focus on what went wrong. <clears throat> Are there models to which you would refer where the response was appropriate and depending on circumstances should be replicated? And what what made those responses so unique and so positive in your judgment? And then I want you to go even further. Say you had a tsunami or an earthquake, maybe even a hurricane that wiped out oh, a state or a territory. And maybe suddenly they didn't have any electricity or they didn't have any roads were out of air. You know. How would you handle that, Mr. President? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> First, First of all, all I know the good lessons to be applied in the future. So, so I, I definitely have lessons learned in the book. And uh, interestingly, when, when I looked at the lessons learned, I had an appendix where I said, here are the, the top things President should know. Uh, and I, I wrote them just as I figured out what I was saying. And then I read, went back and read them, and I realized that six out of nine of those lessons had to do with presidential communication to some degree. 
And so the president is not out there fixing generators or handing out water bottles. Mm -hmm. Or maybe our president throws it paper towels occasionally, but uh, uh, but but in general, the president's not a line responder and shouldn't be expected to be so. But the presidential communication, and there are many aspects of presidential communication, I think is extremely important. The kind of message you send, and it's not just happy talk. Everyone's doing great. Heck of a job, Brownie. Obviously, was not the, the right thing to say. But at the same time, you can't be inducing panic. And if you're too negative about response, I understand why you want to be somewhat rah-rah and say, hey, we are doing a good job here so that people don't get overly uh, cynical or overly concerned. Uh, and then, But the, the number one thing I stress is that you always have to be truthful because if you start saying things truthful, if you say things that are not accurate, then the American people start to lose faith in what you're saying and they're going to tune it out and not listen. In terms of presidents who've been successful, I do have uh, this appendix where I list the five best and five worst presidents in responding to disasters. And on the five best list, I have at the top of the list, uh, Secretary Shalala will be happy to know, uh, President Clinton with the uh, Y2K crisis. Now, obviously, Y2K never became a crisis, but in part, that was because of strong preventive efforts by the Clinton administration over a multi-year period that engaged the states, that engaged locals, that engaged our national, international partners, and also engage the private sector to make sure that it wasn't a problem. Now, we'll never know if Y2K really would have melted or frazzled the, the system, but I always say that the best disasters are the ones that don't occur. Yeah. <clears throat> In the models that you look at, <clears throat> obviously the president uh, uh, in the 21st century has it, it, got to be out it, demonstrate empathy, concern, compassion, but he can't manage the crisis. He can't manage the response and recovery. Are there models there where uh, the president vested an individual with particularly strong authority, given a wide latitude of discretion? Uh, I mean, one of the biggest, worst, best examples I could think of was the uh, George Marshall. We need to rebuild more. We need to rebuild uh, Europe. Uh, you're the man. What are the resources? Develop the strategy. We'll execute the game plan. Are there any historical references where the president? leadership resulted in empowering somebody and investing in them the authority across jurisdictions to get the job done. Yeah, let, let, me, let me give a couple of examples. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, referred to Ron Klain uh, and the efforts he did in the Obama but, but administration. But that we saw That's coming. Right. I mean, I was governor at the time, and I do appreciate that leadership. We had some time to work on it, but now sudden Mother Nature yeah. hits you with something or the pandemic hits you with something. You don't have too much time to prepare for that. So another instance I talk about in the book is 1927, the Mississippi floods. Uh, Calvin Coolidge is president, and at the time, it was not seen as the governmental federal responsibility to get involved in these kinds of things. But things were starting to change, in part because of the spread of radio and na nationwide communications. People were aware of what some of the challenges were. Coolidge's Secretary of Commerce was Herbert Hoover, and Hoover was chomping at the bit to get involved in this situation. Coolidge was reluctant because of his views of what the Constitution said about what the government should be involved in, but he also, uh, frankly speaking, didn't much like Hoover. Uh, he called him the Secretary of Commerce and the Undersecretary of everything else. He said, that man has given me nothing but unsolicited advice for six years, all of it bad. So in part to get Hoover out of his hair, he sends him to Mississippi to deal with this flood, and Hoover, by all accounts, does a fantastic job. He coordinates rescue efforts. He helps um, uh, coordinate what the federal, various federal and uh, state agencies are doing. And he just seems to be the man, uh, uh, the man with the plan on top of things. He even gets a nickname, Master of Emergencies. And he rides this into the White House and becomes a, a president, not a successful president, because he failed to deal with a, another type of crisis, an economic crisis. But uh, so I, I think that's a positive model. I also. Uh, one of the things I talk about when I talk about presidents who are successful is sometimes there are innovations that derive from the disaster response that I think are helpful in the future. And so I give credit to President Nixon in dealing with Hurricane Camille in 1969. He sent Spiro Agnew. I know uh, people usually don't uh, say nice things about Spiro Agnew, but he does send uh, he sends Spiro Agnew down to the um, uh, the affected area to deal, uh, not so just to deal with it, but also to report back and. Agnew comes back and he says, one of the problems that I found there was that we were told that the people didn't know the severity of the hurricane as it was coming. They didn't know whether to shelter in place or to evacuate or how to, to, to wait it out, what, what to do. 
And so Nixon directs the bureaucracy to address this problem. And that's how we have the five scale categorization of hurricane systems that we have today. It was developed in direct response to Hurricane Camille and Agnew's complaint. So I think innovations in, the, in response to disasters, I think, are, are good as well. Um, I give uh, President Bush, um, unfortunately, low marks for his handling of Katrina. But I do say, and I wrote in a recent Wall Street Journal piece, that FEMA learned a lot from Katrina and has gotten a lot better as a result of Katrina. So it's not just how you respond per se, but also what you learn from it and if you bring better things to governmental response in the future as a result. Thank you. Great answer. I do think it's important to point out that the government is dealing with outbreaks every day that you don't necessarily hear about, whether it's foodborne illnesses or a hantavirus out of the Navajo reservation um, or the CDC running off to Hong Kong to help them contain the avian uh, flu. So um, I think it's important that we do have an infrastructure that is responsive when it's localized and uh, when our technical people can actually uh, make a difference. I want to ask you about swine flu because in that case, um, a president decided and um, a department, lots of people decided that we should inoculate everybody. And it was a big mistake as it turned out. It, uh, did you write about swine flu at all? So you're talking about the 75, 76 yes, swine flu, yeah. not the swine flu no, of no, 2009. No. Uh, yeah, so this is an interesting case and I have written about it in, in the Wall Street Journal a couple of months ago. I talked about this issue of presidential credibility. Mm -hmm. When the president gets up there, if there's faith in the president, people will do what he, he asks or he or she asks. And I think that's important. Uh, swine flu took place after you had um, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Vietnam and obviously Richard Nixon and Watergate. And I would say presidential credibility was at a low point. Mm -hmm. And Gerald Ford gets out there and he even rolls up his sleeves and goes on TV and says, everybody, man, woman, and child should get this vaccine. And a really low percentage of the population actually responded. Now, it turned out to be a good thing that a low percentage uh, responded because it happened to be a dangerous vaccine and a number of people got Guillain-Barre syndrome. I hope I'm pronouncing that cor correctly. Uh, but it seems to me that they, they were wrong to demand it. Uh, they were wrong to recognize the lack of presidential credibility that would lead to this request being taken and that not happening. But we ended up dodging a bullet in that more people didn't get that, that problematic vaccine. But I think that the science has improved, and I, I would hope that we wouldn't uh, come up with a vaccine that problematic in the future, but also importantly, that uh, we would have a better sense of when you need to do that kind of inoculation, because we didn't need it in that case. Yeah, it's, but it's not only undermining the credibility of a president Presidents could undermine science and evidence and scientists. I had a rule that no one could talk about science except for scientists. I did not let any elected officials, whether they were in the White House or any place else, and I insisted that my people put on their white coats when they had to report to the American people on uh, specific outbreaks or what strategies we were using um, because people had a lot more confidence in doctors and nurses than they did in elected uh, public officials. And the most dangerous thing to me is the White House press secretary, you know, trotting in the vice president or the president to talk about an outbreak as opposed to, and in fact, we never wanted our scientists to go over the White House. Um, we wanted them to have a separate uh, press conference. I think it's that what's the most dangerous thing here is to undermine evidence-based decisions and scientists and the health officials, first of all, they need, all need media training. And we gave all of ours media training. Apparently in the last administration, they didn't do much of that, but um, media training is important. And the communications people work with them before they got up before a camera on what they were going to say and how they were going to answer questions, much like we did in preparation for secretaries we did murder boards uh, on them so that they were very clear. But what's most dangerous, I think, in this world we're entering in is when non-scientists, non-health officials start talking about these things because in my experience, they never quite get it right. And they undermine the credibility of the whole government. If you don't have a strategy about who's going to speak, 
um, and when they're going to speak and what they're going to say. I think that's a fantastic point, Madam Secretary. And um, should I ever return to government, I'm definitely going to incorporate that white coat rule of uh, making sure the scientists speak w with the white coats. Uh, I, I love it. Um, <laughs> but this is um, reminiscent to me of the other swine flu in 2009 when uh, the Obama administration was relatively new when not a single HHS political official had been confirmed. And I thought that the career folks there, uh, most of whom were scientists who were speaking, I thought did an excellent job of communicating. But the biggest communications misstep came from someone who was a political official who was not wearing a white coat, which was uh, Vice President Biden, who made that comment about not letting people go in enclosed spaces, which I think was a big mistake and it had to be walked back by, by the press secretary. So. Uh, in, in my experience, those people who were the career officials, who were the scientists, had had media training in these areas. This doesn't mean Vice President Biden hadn't had media training. I'm sure he has at some point in his career. But he hadn't had training in how to communicate about these issues. And I think that's an important distinction. May I take the liberty as co-chair? I, 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 just, I, just, I just wanted to commend my friend and colleague for this revolutionary, bold, assertive notion that public policy based on science is normally pretty effective public policy. How, what a bold and revolutionary idea that is. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Well, I'll second that as well. I, uh, Tevi, I'm, I, I'm just uh, amazed at your historical recall and compliment you on your ability to share this, these lessons from history uh, as eloquently and and effectively as you have. I, could I just ask a, about one of the assertions you made that we all share that I think also ought to be explored, and that is how can we build a more effective public-private partnership? And recognizing the importance of the private sector and the role of the industries that uh, have so much of a, of, a, of a constructive contribution to make, are there lessons in history? And if there are, what do we learn? And what are the priorities as we consider building that PPP more effectively going forward? Thank you for that question and for the kind words. Uh, as for the facility of my uh, knowledge of these historical stories, it's a good thing that I'm doing the speech after my book tour and not before, so I've got these uh, at the tip of my tongue. Uh, Public-private partnerships, I, I do agree, are very important. I think we, if we look uh, historically about this uh, 100 years from now, we'll see that we're kind of uh, perhaps at the beginning of understanding of the potential of public-private partnerships. So I, I don't think we're, we're fully developed in the knowledge of how to operate these sufficiently. Um, I did see some examples of uh, presidents working with the, the private sector in my book. Even if you go back to, let's say, um, 1889, the Johnstown flood, uh, 2,000 people die in this flood, and President Harrison is um, reluctant to get the federal government involved and even responds to a telegram from the people of Johnstown asking for help, saying that this is up to the governor, it's not really my responsibility. But then, to his credit, he does go to a fundraiser to help raise funds for the victims. Uh, he gives a $300 personal donation, which is about $7,000, so six real money uh, in today's dollars. Uh, but he also uh, empowers the Red Cross, and I think the Red Cross is a great example of a public-private partnership. And that was the first disaster where the Red Cross really emerged as one of these um, uh, w one of these organizations that helps. And FEMA today, uh, in, in go, going along with this, has on its website all of these um, uh, friend and partner organizations that it lists who go out and help in disasters. You know, in fact, one of the uh, issues uh, that we faced in the Puerto Rico response was, in, in contrast to, let's say, the Harvey response in, in Texas, is the uh, you know Eisenhower did a great thing with creating the interstate road system. And having these interstate highways allowed people to escape, as you saw people from Florida heading north uh, leading uh, before, um, uh, before the hurricane there. Uh, so it allows people to escape, but it also allows the, uh, the Good Samaritans to come in. Uh, I read this one story, a fascinating story, about uh, people in Houston had no access to kosher food because all the, the, the kosher food uh, stores had been flooded. And they were living on, uh, on canned snacks or packaged snacks. And a restaurant in Dallas read about this and drove in with kosher barbecue and fed the Houston uh, Jew Jewish community. Well, Dallas is about 240 miles from Houston. Uh, 
Uh, Puerto Rico is 110 miles across. So there was no outlet for good Samaritans to come in. And so we can have great people in this country and great charitable people who want to help. And I think they're an important part of FEMA's operational plans. But in some circumstances, the, they can't access the people who need help. And that was one of the situations in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Tevi, I first want to just echo their comments about your remarks. They've been great. I think we've had vignettes about maybe 50% of the presidents in U.S. history. <laughs> Keep you here for another half hour. We'll probably clear all of them. Um, but really, great, great stories, and thank you. Um, the issue I want to touch on is um, one of the, the central themes of our work, is, which is the need for coordination in the bio area and how how profound that need is and how difficult it is to actually achieve that coordination. And um, and that, as you know, is one of the sort of central tenets of a number of our recommendations. Um, and you highlighted the medical countermeasures distribution issue. And that's sort of where I, it kind of hit me between the eyes back in, when I was working with a number of you all in this room and Bob Cadlick and others, trying to sort of talk about the various systems for distribution, the pod system, the postal system, et cetera and how many different players at different levels of government need to be sort of all on the same page to, to make that happen. You know, in the last nine years, has there been further thought given to sort of what the optimal system is? I always sort of, I was always partial to the postal system just because it, you know, it, um, it's sort of an elegant solution. It's already sort of a pre-established infrastructure. Just, I guess the question being, has there been sort of more thought about how that can best be done? And has there been more work done in how to centralize and coordinate that effort? Yeah. Excellent questions. Um, I also looked at some of these things you said, like postal and pods. Uh, one of the problems with postal is that the postal union objected, with, with some justification, that they would want a public safety officer with each postal person that's distributing the countermeasures because of the, the dangers involved if, let's say, you have a hard-to-get vaccine. That's understandable, but it also makes it unrealistic. Uh, I, I happen to think that this might be one of those circumstances where technology uh, overtakes government thinking and government planning, you know, with um, health information technology, which is something I, I follow from my, my health background. Uh, the Department of HHS came out with its rules about interoperability right around the same time that the iPad first came out. Well, it probably would have been cheaper to give every doctor in America an iPad and just go from there. Uh, so technology in some cases uh, surpasses it. And I heard Secretary Shalala talking about drones as a potential uh, solution to the distribution issue. So I, I think we may get more and more information about how to, um, uh, how to address the, these issues as technology improves. Uh, one of the things I've been impressed with in FEMA is, uh, you know, I, I was on, um, a, a friend of mine sent me a video of uh, George H.W. Bush visiting a FEMA operations center in um, 1989 after the, uh, the, the earthquake in, in uh, California. And it is not much better than what an operations center would look like in 1932, when there are a couple of people with whiteboards and telephones. Uh, if you go to a FEMA operations center now, it's very high tech with screens. Uh, they have the access, the ability to access social media, and they follow social media. Uh, you have people with apps who can report what some of their challenges are. So I, I think we are getting better and better at integrating technology, social media, communications into FEMA's planning and thinking. I think they're going to get better, better at it in the future. And I think that might help alleviate some of the distribution challenges. Uh, Kevin, you've been great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I failed to mention you are now the president of the American Health Policy Institute, in addition to everything else. So we appreciate very much your contribution today, but also your work with the panel all along, and uh, please stick with us. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Now we'll go to the uh, next panel, uh, Dr. Venkaya, Dr. Mann, and Dr. Rungi. This panel is on, uh, the, uh, focused on basically the question of implementation of the uh, National uh, Biodefense uh, Strategy. We've got three really um, experienced people, so we're grateful to you for coming. Dr. Venkaya uh, is a former special assistant to President George W. Bush for biodefense. He was responsible for producing the National Strategy for Pandemic Influenza. Uh, Dr. Mann is a former Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety at the Department of Ag Agriculture. 
uh, and former director of Food, Agriculture, and Water Security on the Homeland Security Council. And Dr. Rungi is the former Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security and former Administrator, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So really, uh, a lot of service to the public for which we thank you. Um, I think, Dr. Venkaya, we've got you first. Okay. Well, th I want to thank the panel uh, for the opportunity to, to address you and to share some of my thoughts on this important topic. I also want to commend you on a very thorough, comprehensive assessment of the biodefense situation with the Blue Ribbon Report, which I have refreshed my memory on and, and was, uh, again, impressed with how much you covered in that document. <clears throat> of course, I am, I am disappointed, uh, frankly, that the observations that you made are many of the same observations that we made during uh, my time in the White House, where I was with Kurt and working closely with, with Jeff. And uh, it re reflects the, the complexity of the challenge, but it also reflects the, reflects the challenges in government of bringing together disparate departments and agencies uh, in a command and control way when necessary to tackle a, a common challenge. And the first point that I'd like to make is, is around the leadership issue, because in the time that we were working in government, there was a very clear designated office that was responsible for coordinating those agencies to deal with biodefense and, and health issues. And that was the Office of Biodefense that I had the opportunity to, to briefly run. Uh, when, <clears throat> when melamine was discovered in food in China, or when we had the pandemic threat emerge, and every type of health-related event in between there was no question who would coordinate the White House response. And I know the <clears throat> panel has, has discussed this extensively and has proposed a, an approach without taking a position on who should do this. It's very clear that somebody should do this. And it should be known by everyone in advance. They should be plugged into the policy development and response coordination process. And uh, they should be given a level of empowerment that ensures that they can get agencies and department to do what's necessary. So I, I applaud you for that observation and recommendation. Did, did you feel you had that level in that position? I did. Uh, I did. Yes. In 2005, when uh, the H5N1 threat was uh, becoming more and more apparent, uh, the president asked Fran Townsend, who preceded uh, Ken, to, uh, to put together a, a team to develop the national pandemic strategy, and we were allowed to pull seven people from the departments and agencies to the White House for four months to develop that strategy. And so uh, I, I, I do think that that, that uh, delegation of authority was there. The second point that I want to make is around a very specific threat that has come up a few times today, and that is flu. You know, we, I think you all are very well aware of the burden of seasonal influenza here and around the world, and we are, all are very familiar with the threat of uh, pandemic influenza, which is largely predictable. About three times a century, on average, we will face an influenza pandemic. We've already faced one this year. We spend every year between 10 and $20 billion, if you include the indirect costs, on seasonal influenza. It's a massive expenditure for the healthcare delivery system. And yet we still do not have a universal flu vaccine, a vaccine that would protect an individual year over year against strain drift that we know happens, but might even protect an individual against a pandemic strain of virus. And the reality is that there is not a level of investment occurring in this space that is commensurate with the threat. Unlike Ebola, unlike Zika, uh, unlike SARS and MERS, where there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether this is going to be a problem, we know it's going to be a problem. And it, it's not only going to be a seasonal problem, it will be a pandemic issue someday. And so this is an investment that, uh, and a commitment that is necessary. We need mission-driven research driven by an entity in the government that is going to commit to delivering a product, which is a universal flu vaccine. I think that BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, is the natural home for this. BARDA is a, a great accomplishment, I believe, of the biodefense enterprise, and they have, a, have built a great track record of bringing products to, to market in this space. The third point I'll make is around regulatory science. Uh, we have seen uh, challenges with Ebola uh, and we're now seeing challenges with Zika. I, I'm now the president of, uh, of the vaccine business at Takeda Pharmaceuticals, and we are the only large company that has a contract with BARDA to produce a Zika vaccine. 
Now, uh, Zika is very challenging for a company because you don't know what's happening with the Epi and whether there will be a market. You uh, are facing 30 plus other companies that have said that they're going to produce vaccines. Uh, and there's substantial opportunity cost to tackle an, unknown, an uncertain threat like Zika relative to other ways you could invest capital in a company. BARDA has come in and funded, uh, funded the Zika program, and that has de-risked the program for us so we can take it forward. Uh, however, we still have a challenge that we're working with FDA on, and the Ebola companies, uh, that are, those that are developing those vaccines, are working on it as well, to find a pathway to license a vaccine when the disease has gone away. So the fact that we don't have Ebola outbreaks happening on a predictable basis means that you can't test the effectiveness of a preventive intervention like a vaccine. The same issue is going to happen with Zika as the epidemic has gone down. And so I'm happy to say that there are some good alternative pathways for licensure that are being discussed. But I believe that FDA has an opportunity to make this a routine approach to certain types of threats so that we know, and it's predictable for companies, that if you can demonstrate efficacy in animals or in a human challenge model or in some other approach, that you get a provisional licensure and then you can at least uh, do final evaluation during, during an outbreak. The, uh, the fourth point I'll make is around uh, the, the challenges that come with the positioning of biodefense. And this reflects uh, my time in government, but also my time at the Gates Foundation, where I was before I came to Takeda. I ran the vaccine delivery team there and had extensive engagement in the international community. The, uh, the Blue Ribbon Report does talk about international engagement and talks specifically about the global health security agenda, which I think is a, a tremendous advancement in our way of engaging around these issues. But there is a, a challenge when we talk about biodefense in the U.S. and outside the U.S. In the U.S., when you say biodefense to a lot of people, particularly in the public health community and the medical community, people turn off in many cases because biodefense is seen as something that is hypothetical, theoretical, something that frankly has not yet emerged on a big scale in this country. And it's something that people see as it's someone else's job the reality is if we want a system that is going to work in the U.S., we need to be investing in the capability to deal with daily threats in public health and in medicine, and those preparedness efforts will serve us very well in a bio event, deliberate or nationally occurring. The, the last point I'll make on this is that in the international community, the same applies. If you want to uh, engage somebody in approaches to improve surveillance or response capability, talk about how to strengthen their health system don't talk about biodefense because people don't have the flexibility, the resources to be able to focus on a threat that the U.S. thinks is important but doesn't help or affect their daily lives. And this concept of going to where people are in their heads to engage them I think is very important. It applies domestically and internationally. And I could say a lot more, but I, I have colleagues that have, I'm sure, much more important things to say, so I'm going to stop there. Thanks. What you said uh, was very helpful. Uh, thank you. Dr. Mann. Thanks for inviting me back. Uh, this is the third time I've been before this panel, and I hope I don't wear out my welcome or repeat myself Go too ahead, much. Mark. And mm -hmm. also thanks to staff who put this together and, and uh, are pushing this forward. I, I want to say a special thanks to each one of you and, and the ex officio panel members, because I think this is a great service. I mean, I've been watching you from the hinterlands and, and uh, was wondering what this would become, and I'm very impressed with uh, what the attention you're drawing. I hope it's more and becomes more with time, but I think patience is indicated, and I very much appreciate the fact that you are spending your time and lending your reputations and your names to this mission. Thank you. Thank you. So you're asked today is a perspective on implementation of a national strategy, which you've called for. And in that uh, ask, you included the word innovation, and I'm delighted you did so, because I think that's important. So for my few minutes, um, I'd like to touch on some themes. The distance between policy and outcome, the relationship between inspiration and outcome, and the importance of design to an outcome. So you probably can see that outcome is my theme. And I think if there's going to be any updates to biodefense policy, I see designing those policies in ways that will instill and promote 
achievement and particular outcomes to be paramount. Design for outcome. Uh, speaking generally and probably from 30,000 feet, I do not think there's much to be added to the tenants or the general pillars of biodefense at this time. Any new national strategy and implementation should encompass the age old fundamental principles of awareness, detection, and warning, prevention, and protection, preparedness, response, recovery, attribution. And as long as certain parts of each one of those tenets are commonly known and understood by all, open source, if you will, you will accomplish deterrence and help dissuade potential adversaries. These fundamentals are not that complex or difficult to comprehend, and they do not need to be reinvented. Uh, if the choices you make with, it's, what's hard is the choices you make within each one of these categories that becomes a little ticklish. And that even makes it harder when you add in the competition for resources. I understand the politics and the need for rebranding between in administrations, but I urge the Blue Ribbon Group here to be an advocate for building upon and contemporizing the policies that we've accomplished of, in the past. So I see the first order task of a new biodefense strategy as a refresh and a coordination of the directives and the existing policies. And whether it is a new presidential directive or management memo or overarching strategy or implementation plan, we have a decade of history of both accomplishments and unfortunately many difficulties and things we have not been able to move forward on. I believe any new biodefense policy has to be linked to or that it has to internalize in some way a philosophy of active and robust review, evaluation, and then renewal. With the wisdom of hindsight, which we all eventually gain with gray hair, I consider one of my biggest mistakes that I made as the author of HSPD 9 to not have fought for and included um, in, within that document uh, conditions outlining how we would do review and renewal put in triggers or mechanisms that would cause the directive to be more of a living document and uh, on, become an ongoing uh, phenomenon that is reviewed periodically through assessments and oversight transparency and quality customer inputs. I would not make that mistake twice if I was the one drafting the new biodefense strategies today. With respect to this new and upcoming strategy, biodefense strategy, I suggest that the ultimate goal should be an impl implementation process that is constantly looking for outcomes, measurable outcomes, and that those outcomes have to include cross-cutting coordination of diverse partners and specific and purposeful empowerment of communities that are on the front lines of any biological event. I would suggest in that room or the rooms where they're considering and drafting this, this new defense, biodefense strategy, that someone write on the wall in great big letters, Ronald Reagan's words, governments tend not to solve problems, only to rearrange them. So the distance between strategy and an outcome can be a great distance. And crossing that terrain in between is a been a challenge to humans since we started gathering together into tribes and having to coordinate ourselves. Because in that space between strategy and an outcome is um, a phenomenon that makes the journey either short and almost effortless or impossible. And that factor is culture. Uh, I believe it was Peter Drucker, the guru of management, who said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And there are a number of cultures to be found in biodefense that, because it is so diverse. Consider and respect the culture challenges we face and as you design for an outcome. To be successful with biodefense strategy, I suggest the Blue Ribbon Panel advocate for some type of culture planning too. In order to cross this divide from policy to results, from strategy to outcomes, it requires certain and extraordinary leadership inspiring people, communities, and organizations so that they do not, they do what they would not normally do. Members of biodefense decision making, because of the complexity and overlap of the issue, can never be completely handed back over to the individual departments and agencies. 
and will always need strong centralized leadership and management. I recognize that you as a panel have advocated for that centralized leadership and, and from your earliest documents in recommending the vice president fit this bill. And I have said to this panel in the past, uh, I'm in agreement very much with that centralized uh, leadership. I struggle with the vice president being the best solution exclusively though. From my experience and observations in federal service, leadership, wherever it's gonna be located, must be connected to the budget process. I would suggest that the panel consider a specific design for leadership here, because this goes to su successful implementation. I submit that biodefense leadership and management must follow the money and be ready to measure outcomes in order to make effective accomplishments and move forward. Whatever centralized leadership structure exists or is created by directive and or strategy, I believe for a successful imp implementation, the M has to be added back into OMB. I suggest a unique and a new role or roles perhaps to be created and adapted to the Office of Management and Budget. For instance, the placement of a biodefense czar-like director position attached to the director's office, accompanied by a career executive director, both of which are able to command the authority and effectively crosswalk the, the biodefense issues uh, between the various assistant directors in their areas of specializations, the, the PADS and the DADS. And as a custom within OMB, the, the finalizing of a president's budget, yearly budget, the OM dire OMB director holds budget meetings, or director's meetings they're called. Well, I think there should be institutionalized a director's biodefense meeting, similar to the ones that already occur for the other program areas. Again, biodefense does not fit neatly, you well know it, into any one department or agency, and the budget supporting those efforts should be uniquely considered in an integrated fashion across those traditional program areas. I restate and emphasize that success in the form of real improvement and real outcomes involves anchoring yearly measurement objectives, milestones, and benchmarks established to develop and attain an increasing level of maturity and complexity over time. The Office of Management and Budget is the correct place to accomplish this goal for the United States government. Use the budget process to enforce the design for outcome. Leadership for biodefense, in order to be successful, has to involve the budget. Establishing, achieving, maintaining some quality standard for biodefense preparedness, especially in my, in my uh, mission area or my previous mission area, agri-defense, it has been elusive. I am a believer in looking at to history or comparable situations from which to learn. I draw your attention to the nuclear power industry. I personally live within a 10 mile potential impact zone of a nuclear reactor. And I also know that there are nearly 100 reactors across the United States. So rarely, we know, rarely there has been an incident from these energy sources. And if you think about it, that community the nuclear power community, cannot prepare themselves with real life incidents or live fire practice. They use simulations and measure their capabilities. They ready themselves by use of periodic ongoing progressive outcome, progressive outcome simulations to understand that teach preparedness and learn pathways to mitigation. They do this so that I can live eight miles away from three reactors in that plant, and I don't worry. Unfortunately, my power, my electric bill is the same as yours probably. The communities and the state and the federal authorities and the plants take this seriously, evaluate them themselves every couple of years. It's a mandatory thing every couple of years. They be, they're being held accountable to their s simulation uh, results. The centralized leadership and authority for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in partnership with FEMA and the state emergency management agencies direct all this. Simulation testing and learning is increasingly, increasingly being used in the military and in industry and in gov other gov government agencies. 
exercises have been used to a certain degree in, in the biodefense arena, both the human and the animal. Bio events have been held, but never to the degree or the sophistication and ongoing serious, seriousness that the nuclear power industry does. There may be something here for biodefense to learn and emulate. I suggest that if biodefense management embrace the art of simulation as a methodology to measure and improve, to be developed and refined as a tool to pursue excellence and outcomes over time, and not one-off games occasionally performed and played, we would see growth in confidence with part of our biodefense preparedness spectrum, the preparedness response recovery portions. Thinking differently is the beginning of innovation. We are now approaching a 14-year anniversary since those earliest biodefense policies and directives were created. It is time for a renaissance in biodefense thinking, in particular in my, the agri-defense side. I believe that we can accomplish this biodefense differently. I believe real biodefense is closer to the people than the government. So how do we get closer to the people? I suggest our organizational structures dedicated to vigilance and solutions should re reflect an inclination toward the community. All the same actors are required. The current diverse set of federal departments and agencies, the states, the frontline authorities, where the real incidents happen and unfold and where they're dealt with, as well as the private sector and individuals too. If we consider the biodefense landscape of agriculture and food, and ecosystem services and a, a national economy situation. The focus on the relationship between the states and the federal entity in that relationship, states own agriculture. The states are closer to the people, the committees and the solutions. The federal is an interstate coordinator, international representative and a defender. If there is a bio incident in a state, it is the state's hands that get dirty. The federal shows up with the money if they're asked, and they are always asked. And they, and if the incident proves to be a bioterror, then the federal becomes predominant. In this relationship, the states are in many ways the first line customer of biodefense implementation plans. And they are often the sentinels, responders, keepers, and doers of all these federal policies as they're drafted. How might these first order customers, the states, be empowered to assist in driving ideas, accountability, and outcomes. While this, set, this suggestion I'm, I'm gonna make is, might be and probably is beyond the scope of the executive branch national biodefense strategy all by itself, or its implementation plan by itself. I believe the states, if they were brought together as compacts, encompassing regions and challenge to be part of the strategy and solutions, as well as as a source of accountability, just because of their customers, the federal biodefense strategy and implementation would have more life to it. By comparison, to paint my picture, as someone who lives eight miles away from a nuclear reactor, I am always interested that the reactor safety and security is done well. So in sum, I, biodefense after 16 years since we started, I'm hopeful that we are on a new era for it. And, of coordination and institutionalization of certain design structures. Establish and stabilize White House leadership and management. I didn't talk about this today, but to accomplish integrated, expanding horizon capabilities that involve anticipation and awareness and warning. Embrace simulation as a tool to teach, to measure, to evolve. Empower and establish partnership equilibrium between communities state, federal, and private. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Mann, for the work and thoughtfulness you gave to that. It's very helpful. Dr. Rungi. Here we go. I think it's flashing red and green. Is it working? OK, great. Uh, I also want to echo the, the uh, comments of my fellow panelists, thanking you for the time and dedication that you've put into this issue. Um, I know that for many of us, this is a, uh, a passion that uh, we simply can't shed uh, over the last 20 years. And, and uh, again, I thank you for, for your leadership. Um, we did not coordinate our remarks, um, but I think you'll hear some of them rhyming uh, quite well. 
uh, and I want to try to limit my comments to the task that you ask us to tackle, and that is what are our recommendations for the implementation of the national strategy. And I want to focus um, my remarks in, in two areas. Number one, leadership. And number two, the fact that a strategy is necessary but completely insufficient. Um, so first of all, the, the leadership issue. Um, this is one that I'm sure Secretary Ridge um, will associate with, and that is uh, that um, in the wake of 9-11, of in the wake of, of uh, the anthrax attack and so forth, um, DHS was created to weave together these multiple interests in the interagency uh, uh, by, in fact, incorporating some uh, into a department and, and, and other uh, realms coordinating among the departments. Um, that has worked um, not as well, I think, as everyone had hoped when we first set up the department. Um, there was this little thing called HSPD-5, which was a declaration by the president of how it was supposed to work. And sadly, uh, not every one of Secretary Ridges and Secretary Chertoff's colleagues uh, signed off on HSPD-5. And to be quite blunt, um, uh, there was a competition among the departments, and uh, in spite of good leadership uh, at the department in trying to coordinate and collaborate, uh, oftentimes uh, the silos that have been previously mentioned uh, were uh, sufficiently impenetrable uh, that um, uh, the department failed in, in doing that coordination through no fault of its own. Uh, nothing, nowhere is this more true than, than biodefense. Um, on top of that, you mentioned the congressional committee structure uh, and the traditional flow of funds to the various departments uh, that were jealously guarded uh, rather than having an enterprise strategy towards uh, investment uh, in a long-term uh, st strategy uh, planning and imp implementation uh, across the entire enterprise. Uh, on top of that, the DHS has had a very small footprint in, the, in this particular area uh, since its inception, um, with the uh, finally setting up of an Office of Health Affairs in, in 2006. Uh, but again, even with a very small, f small footprint. Um, as a result of this, uh, the Homeland Security Council stepped up uh, and institutionalized biodefense leadership um, in the White House in the form of a president, presidential biodefense advisor, advisor in the uh, HSC and importantly, a staff to, to, uh, to work with that biodefense advisor in order to uh, coordinate and implement strategy and planning and policy uh, that uh, could be coordinated. Um, no one can get a meeting put together like a presidential advisor. Uh, people show up, and people show up who can actually make a difference. Um, the uh, involvement of the White House um, it, it enabled prioritization. It enabled the involvement of OMB that Dr. Mann mentioned. Um, the White House can go to congressional leadership without ha actually having to negotiate 89 different congressional committees to get something done. Uh, and it can task the departments, most importantly. And this sort of tasking is going to be necessary if an implementation of a national strategy is to be successful. So I want to echo uh, something that Kurt said uh, it, it almost doesn't matter where it is in the White House, if it's in the, if it's in the national security staff close to the, to the director uh, or if it's in the vice president's office. But I, I want to compliment you all for taking this on. Uh, the WMD Commission also talked about this. Uh, but sadly, uh, for you know, during the last administration, that level of attention inside the White House has been lacking. Uh, We've had numerous national strategies uh, for this and that, and I want to uh, go back to a HSPD 9 and 10 as being pretty good foundational documents. Uh, and you know, whether it's agro-defense and, and HSPD 9 or, or biodefense HSPD 10, uh, they were good starting points, but the momentum has, in fact, been lost. But the pillars of HSPD 10 of threat awareness and prevention and protection, surveillance and detection, and response and recovery uh, offer a, a, a pretty good architecture and framework for, for moving forward. But we need more than a strategy. We need an implementation plan 
with a cascade of assignments and resources that that last longer than a political cycle. Uh, to the extent possible, obviously, it would be apolitical. Uh, it's really everyone's business, and not just human health, not just protecting people, but also uh, veterinary and animal concerns, food safety, uh, food security, uh, environmental impacts, which obviously have their own impacts on both human and animal health, as well as water and, and food security. So I will zoom to the end here to, to allow you some time to reflect, but I have sort of four broad uh, areas in which I would recommend uh, uh, that the, the panel consider advising um, the White House on this issue. Number one is leadership. Um, Biodefense in this country has to have uh, leadership within the White House with gravitas, scientific basis, vision, and operational experience. And likewise, that leadership has to exist in the departments and agencies that interact with this biodefense advisor. Uh, I was very inexperienced in this issue when I uh, took on the job of chief medical officer in, in the department. Um, and it, it took a long time, frankly, to, to gear up. Um, I would encourage the White House Personnel Office to make sure that the appointments that are made to these biodefense rele relevant positions in the agencies uh, are selected with great care and with a minimum of political consideration. Number two, uh, as I said, we cannot stop with the strategy. We desperately need an implementation plan with the authorities, the personnel, and the budget in order to see through to completion the sub-objectives that, that uh, Admiral Zimmer mentioned earlier today. Uh, and we have to get back to, this, to, the, to the national response framework where we talk about planning, training, equipping, exercising, leading back to the plan. Um, number three, to make sure that that equip part is part of an acquisition system that uh, succeeds uh, political cycles. Um, you, you know, going back to, to you know Kurt's outcome-driven uh, design. Uh, you know, when the when the requirement for a a uh, radar evading aircraft was made, no one expected that to be done in in two years, or four years. It was part of an acquisition strategy, uh, with an outcome at the end, uh, inviting different players and finally narrowing it down to to getting the job done. We have to have that same sort of approach to acquisitions in the biodefense realm. Um, and this is true not just for medical countermeasures, but for every capability that is necessary uh, all the way down to the state and locals. And number four, uh, is, is uh, the segue into that is, is that the federal government is not the solution to the biodefense problem. Yes, we can have strategy and policy and implementation plans, but ultimately when there is an aerosolization when there is an outbreak of foot and mouth disease or, or you know, something that threatens our, our agricultural uh, or food supply. The feds aren't there. Uh, the local responders, the EMS agencies, police, fire, uh, the local public health, uh, the capacity building that has to occur at the local level in order to be the tip of the spear for that response and recovery effort is absolutely essential. And I think that oftentimes in, in the federal government, we see this as, a, as an add-on. It's not. It's absolutely integral. Uh, the National Biosurveillance Integration Center at, at, at DHS is now taking a, a ground-up approach towards uh, uh, outbreak detection, which is, a, which is a brilliant strategy. And I would, I would offer that that the, the, the national biodefense strategy has to, in fact, be national and not just federal. So um, that's, uh, that's my number four, and I'll close right there. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, too. <coughs> Three of you have really added value. Yes. Tom? Terrific testimony. Listen, I, the beautiful thing, the theme around the, the, this panel is that you've all been responsible for building strategies, implementing strategies, so a lot of kernels of information we've got to extract from you. Number one, would you recommend to uh, the Admiral, who talked very strongly about his role in building a strategy, that there be a accompanying document called implementation? <laughs> yes, sir. We didn't hear that. No. That might be something that we want to follow along. And when you built your respective documents, did you 
we've heard about metrics and outcomes. We love that. If it's measurable, you can do something with it. Did, did they all include uh, measurables and outcomes? You know, it's, it's wide open. And uh, you know, I, I would offer that. Line. I would offer it. So, so as Senator Lieberman mentioned, my, my first job in government was the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And the difference between that and the biodefense enterprise is that we had 6.3 million crashes a year. And when I came into office, there were 43,801 highway deaths. These are easily measurable, and your progress is therefore easily measurable. In the case of biodefense, and there may be examples like influenza regime where we do have measurable, you know, 30-something odd, odd deaths a year, but, but uh, in, in the case of intentional uh, releases of, of, of biological weapons or, or other threats that do not occur, possibly because of prevention, possibly because of, of for, for whatever reason, it's very difficult to have anything but surrogate measures of performance. Uh, and, you know, we can talk all day about what those, what those might be, but, but for this particular enterprise, the, the measures of performance are just a little more elusive. I think this is very important, but there is precedent in, in the government. I'll just use the example of the pandemic strategy, which was a 12-page document, and the implementation plan, which was about a 150-page document that contained about 300, a little over 300 actions. Each of them had a, uh, a time-limited, deliverable, a lead agency, supporting agencies. And every year, after for three years after that um, implementation plan was uh, issued, there was a report card that was uh, publicized uh, by the White House. So, so this, this can be done, and, uh, and I think we've seen this actually with, with, with other strategies and implementation plans, but I think it's critically important because otherwise uh, it, 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 the obvious happens where you just have one more document that sits on the shelf. The only thing I would add is um, with the strategies we developed 14 years ago, in my opinion, the answer to your question, did we have metrics in there, is yes and no. And um, there were some and that's one of my failings. I think in uh, the part that I was responsible for, I didn't think through this well enough and do it well enough. But not to make excuses, but at the time we were just, we were trying to get, you think there are silos now being talked about, and there always will be, but we were trying to even imagine trying to create what this thing, Homeland Security, is, and what was the, what was going to be the next, when was the next shoe going to fall? So. We were trying to convince, through interpersonal relations, convince people to do things. Um, applying metrics to them at that point might have been counterproductive at that point. We needed to get them to even understand what Homeland Security, what we thought threats were at the time. So yes, we did put some metrics in. I wish they were better. But I think we have a maturity now. People understand the word biodefense now, or agri-defense, or we, we understand what Homeland Security, the philosophy of it is a little bit more. So we can cross this bridge now, I think, and do it even better with met, uh, measurement and demanding accountability and outcomes and tying it to the money. Sure, please. You ran the Office of Biodefense for two, three years. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought, I'm, I've got you out there, all right, and or someone in that position. I've got some national security staffer, maybe an assistant to the president for biodefense. That's a potential point of integration. I say this with great respect. I don't see anybody from the National Security Council or anybody in that position or a similar position in HHS or any place else, picking up the phone and calling OMB and saying, you know, I know that's what the department requested, but it's inconsistent with the strategy. I want you to push the money from point A to point B. We locked on to the vice president based on experiences that I think we've all seen. I've seen Vice President Pence up on the hill already. I thought one of the most underutilized assets that President Obama had was his vice president. Yeah. When he went up to the hill, he normally got things done. I know in my world, the vice president, Vice President Cheney, got us involved in biodefense, got us involved in nuclear detection. So with respect to those good, competent, quality people who work in subsets in departments, 
as some assistant to the president for homeland security or for biosecurity with the national security council who coordinates this to make sure that the implementation is followed and the funding follows the implementation help me i think it help. absolutely i i think that experience and we all talk yeah. about the silos they've been talking silos in this in this city for 25 years i i can speak to the great one of concerns we have so sure and and the sequel to that maybe there is somebody in the new restructuring in the white house is a place we can go that i'm not familiar with so your your thoughts on that would be helpful and all all right better than better than all right all right I think it all comes down to uh, who the, the level of importance of the issue to the president and the authority that he delegates to uh, the people that report to him. And the reality is that uh, if you uh, designate OVP to be the lead, but then don't empower OVP to do anything about it, then you're going to have the same problem. So I think if you have a, a national security advisor, whom I, I think can play, does play this role in other areas like defense. Uh, to a degree, um, where they can come in and speak to OMB about about these issues, and they have the standing to do that. That is, uh, to me, is a, uh, a a vehicle that we should capitalize on. And I would I would uh, offer that you could have a deputy for biosecurity or biodefense that reports to the assistant to the president for national security affairs, who could play that role. And then, as things are reach the level of assistant to president to cabinet secretary. You just take it up the chain, and they, they work it out, and you bring in OMB. So I, I think this can be managed. The, the advantage to bringing this into the national security construct is you have a very mature policy-making process. It's tested every day, and we use it for North Korea. We use it for you know everything else that's really important in the government. So there's no question that if the National Security Council is considering something, it's an important issue. So I think that that is a a natural mechanism by which to elevate things, escalate things, and uh, to and get decisions. That's my opinion. I, I struggle. I have struggled for years over sort of the, the crux of your question is, you know, where, where and how. And I, um, you know, the vice president is, like I think I said in Kansas to you, Senator Dashiell, this vice president is dynamite probably in, in a role like this, but the next vice president, I don't know. And I also know this from personal experience through uh, multiple years working as a staffer in the Hill and having to go to the executive branch to accomplish things from the congressional side of things and also working in the White House and within a department, is that yeah. vice presidents and president staffs sometimes don't get along. And there's competition and infighting and there's silos right in there. Um, I think statutory, or I think legally we might even have a little bit of a challenge. I'm sure there's workarounds for it, for a, a vice president to lead a national um, um, on, the, on behalf of the president. I think that could be worked around, but um, I don't really have a great answer as to the perfect. I know it has to be elevated, and I happen to probably be in, with Rajiv in his comments that the, you know, have to be some statutory changes probably with the, national, the, 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 the guidance of the National Security Council too, but it, it needs to be up there with those type of people. I would only add, uh, Secretary Ridge, that um, this particular discipline r requires um, really good career staff who understand the science, understand the problem, understand the issues with state and locals, uh, and to the extent that an office can be created to focus uh, and not be distracted by uh, every other gigantic problem that comes across the vice president's desk, I think it would be advantageous for this, for this discipline. So to the extent that wherever that office that can focus through political cycles uh, could exist is what's needed. That's right. We like the idea of the vice president, but the bottom line is who? It may not be the vice president, but who has the authority of number one or number two to make these things happen? So it's not, uh, it's, we think about that all the time. It's like great to have a strategy, good to have an implementation plan, but in this town, things don't get done unless the money's moved around. And all of you, I think, have alluded to with your patience, I, I, wherever it is and how big it is I, uh, in the in the White House, it's important. But I think, as I said earlier, you have to make the OMB process tied into it intimately, and with permanent staff there.
probably have to have politicals on top of it too, but you have to have a permanent cross-cutting strategy there too. Donna? Yeah, I think, whoops. I think the concern here is that um, OMB could put the money in and make that commitment, but who's going to hold the agencies accountable? And that was the point about centralizing responsibilities, the development of the strategy, the implementation plan, getting the money for it, and then holding, it's got to be seamless um, in this strategy. Um, I had a quick question for Rajiv. Um, uh, it just as an aside, you said that uh, uh, rather than making an argument about biosecurity, we should make an argument to build the infrastructure. Um, the only thing I'd say to you as someone who spent years, literally eight years, trying to convince Congress and um, the administration that we should invest in the infrastructure of the states and, and, um, and cities, that it's easier to argue from bioterrorism than it is to argue, use a word like infrastructure. Infrastructure, their eyes glaze over. Bioterrorism, someone sits up. So we use bioterrorism as the wedge to convince people that they had to make investments in the uh, infrastructure. And that's part of the discussion uh, that's going on here. I think, I think what, um, what uh, probably often happens in, in localities is that people take the biodefense money and they use it for whatever they need in right. to, to build the infrastructure. And I, I completely understand the need to um, motivate uh, allocations or appropriations of, of resources. My point is that um, uh, you know one way to to approach this would be to have uh, bio defense related metrics or ways to evaluate the strengthening of the system at the local level. So you have things that you know are good surrogates for rapid response. Right. But the the reality is that um, that means you'd have to fine tune the block grant that CDC gives to states. Yeah. Right. You, that's some, that's line, that which that we haven't done. I think is important. I also think we're 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 very under resourced. I don't think this necessarily though needs to be all federal funding. I mean, the states have a vested interest in allocating sufficient Absolutely. budget to local infrastructure to respond to day to day events, which will serve them well in a disaster. And Jeff could speak at length about this. I can. I mean, the um, I mean, the difficulty with most state budgets is is that is that. Uh, Health and Human Services at the state level is usually the biggest piece of the pie chart. Uh, Medicaid provision is usually the biggest piece of that pie chart. Uh, by the time you get to public health preparedness, it's a pretty it's a pretty small sliver uh, of the state budget and, and depends quite heavily on hospital preparedness funds and, and others that are coming from the feds. Having said that, uh, you know it's 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 quite lumpy with regard to the amount of, of effort put at the at the local level regarding public health preparedness. Um, every state is not equal. Oftentimes the funds do get sent to a hospital to build a decon shower, which may never be used, and, and so forth. So um, again, those measures of performance and metrics, which HHS, to their credit, has developed over some of these funds, uh, is driven down to the states. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I worry you know, if anything keeps me up at night, it's the it's the ability of a local community to respond in a timely enough fashion uh, to take care of its citizens, uh, which you know is bound to cause a crisis in, in, in government if it's not done well. Ken, thanks, Dr. Mann. I want to follow up with you, if I could, on your you made a couple of intriguing comments about culture. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the need for coordination. Obviously, that's a theme in a number of the questions here today. Um, and I think one of the more complicating overlays on this coordination issue, and this, of course, is not the only one that government's confronted, but on this one is, is the culture issue where you have a number of different communities that all need to coordinate health, military, law enforcement, et cetera. Um, and, I, you know, we've seen this over time since 9-11. I was involved in the so helping to merge the, the intelligence community culture with the law enforcement culture, taking down that wall between the two of them. And that worked pretty well, actually, but it took the 9-11 attacks for it to happen, and it took President Bush having the attorney general and the CIA director and the FBI director in his office every morning for you know, six mornings a week um, getting briefed and also forcing that coordination. And the upshot of that was you then finally had information sharing that you didn't have before. So. 
that was actually sort of a good news story where two different cultures actually started to work together. I think the challenge here is even more pronounced, and there are more cultures at play in some ways. You mentioned the word culture management, I think, or the term culture management, and then moved off without defining what that was. Do you have any thoughts? Is there a secret sauce here that we can apply, or is there a way we take that issue head on to try to deal with it? I don't proclaim to be an expert in this area, but it is talked about in um, leadership and management at the academic level and within business, in the business world, about culture planning and uh, the importance of it because all your best ideas can go to naught if you don't take that into account as you approach it, approach a, a, a change. It's a part of change management, which is becoming more and more of a buzzword too now. Uh, no, I do not have any secret sauces. I, what little I do know is probably just what I've learned by experience and that uh, by being a student of human behavior uh, and watching people as to what they do and what makes them um, tick and uh, trying to appeal to that side personally. And that's how I've been successful in my leadership. I think if you do, whatever the magic is here, but I think culture planning, you have to go to every one of these silos or agencies, and they have a right to their culture too, and you have to respect it. And I think that's the first step, is culture planning means you respect the persons that you're maybe trying to help along or change. And um, they, they have other jobs. They had previous jobs before um, biodefense wasn't thought about seriously. Uh, their jobs are driven by statute to solve other problems. Uh, I know for the, in the Department of Agriculture, this is a nuisance sometimes, this thing called biodefense. They have other things with very little money to do that they're being told to do by Congress. Again, some cultures are so hard to break in, the, in a bureaucracy in, the, in our federal system here because they're protected by committees on the Hill because that culture is there also. And so my, my secret sauce, if you will, is to respect that culture first, and then you have to appeal to their, as the overused term, better angels. Right, and I think, just to follow up, I mean, obviously that's one of the main functions of the interagency process, right, is to get the different constituencies and different different interests, but also different cultures at the table with a common mission. And, you know, I think one of the reasons for our recommendation that it be a coordinating council was because we thought this this sort of culture Integration might even be so challenging that it might be tough just to, might be too taxing for the existing interagency. We might want to have its own little sort of coordinating council. So. So, so. Thank each of you for your contributions today and for all that you have provided in good leadership. Uh, I, I would just go back 16 years and reflect on what, if anything, we've done to institutionalize our responsibility uh, over these, these this last decade and a half. 9-11 uh, was a physical attack for which we didn't have much of an institutional response. We created one with the Homeland Security um, uh, infrastructure over the, the, the months that followed. The anthrax attack that followed was also uh, <laughs> An attack, but that was uh, one for which we did have somewhat of a response through CDC and NIH, um, but in my view, not a not an effective response overall. In that, we certainly, uh, I don't think, uh, prepared ourselves for the next one. We were able to respond in keeping everybody healthy, which is really the key thing. But I guess institutionally, I, the question I would have is, what have we learned, and if there was an attack again tomorrow, um, how would our institutional response differ from what we demonstrated 16 years ago? Um, that's a very good question, and it's a it's a difficult thing to wrap my mind around it, but I think that a difference, because I was, I happened to be sitting as a special assistant to a secretary at the time when um, the planes flew into the, our buildings, 
And then all of a sudden, within so many hours, I had a top secret clearance and I was designated the director of all things that we were going to do for defense in the, you know, on the homeland here for that particular department. Um, and I think what we, what's been instituted, it's not the right use of the word, but what is different now than then is we were starting completely from scratch and people couldn't get the, uh, couldn't get their mind around what this was, uh, what the threat was and what was this thing that the White House was trying to do called Homeland Security. So there was a certain amount of pushback and I don't know if it was premeditated, you know, honoriness, but it was, I don't understand this. I don't know what we're doing. I think today, if the same thing happened, while there may not be specific institutions built into the system completely yet, there there is enough of a memory, a muscle memory, if you will, that we would probably achieve some sort of response quicker or our cultures would be uh, melded into one for a common purpose more. I think that might be the difference in my mind is in 2001, we didn't know what to do and people didn't know what to do. In, two, in 2018 or 17, I think we would uh, naturally move forward faster. I, I guess I would just ask though, Kurt, uh, just to clarify, um, I'm not sure I understood from your response who you think would take the lead institutionally today. Oh, you, well, I think it has to be the president. I mean, if uh, today it still would be the president. Anytime you have something of this magnitude, it has to be the president. Now, they may have a, a much more robust infrastructure around them. But I thought you were talking, excuse me. I no, I, well, I was more referring of, to both, but, but I just on that, on that particular point, you think, you think if the president just said do it, yeah. somehow the institution would find itself the I right we, mechanism to respond. I think we would be more nibble-footed we, we're not perfect, but we'd be n much more nimble-footed now than we were then. I, I would like to agree with that as well, Senator Daschle. And, and um, we have institutions now that we did not have back then. Uh, we do have uh, uh, functioning systems in place. My, my fear is is that unlike a natural disaster where we have really good weather predictions and so forth, we we are way behind in detection of something once it has occurred. Uh, we do not have uh, clinical surveillance systems adequately set up in order to determine when we are in the middle of, or when we're at the beginning of an outbreak, or the middle for that matter. Uh, we have uh, ancient technology uh, for environmental detection for which there's been no, uh, no tangible uh, improvement um, since, it's, since the system started in, in February of 2003. Uh, so my concern is is that we are going to be if, if there's an intentional release of an agent we will be in the middle of it uh, with the disaster already occurring uh, with uh, I mean just just to lay the scenario out let's just say that there's an aerosolization of any any size in a major city um, the people who have the largest exposure and I'm have a particular agent in mind uh, will consume the resources of the health institutions first, and they will not be salvageable. Uh, to to then get countermeasures, antibiotics into the into the bodies of people who uh, are in that penumbra of treatable within some time frame, which is of course altered if it's not a naturally occurring outbreak, uh, is we relying on institutions that have not been proven, um, uh, and frankly, not tested in, in quite a long time, uh, but uh, for which we have systems that are nominally in place. Um, that's a, you know, it's a large concern. Unfortunately, that those people are also going to get sick and the resources to take care of them are also going to be uh, uh, consumed by group number one. So we have not thought through this adequately right now. We, there is science that has, has uh, frankly not been dealt with uh, because of earlier assumptions that we made in, in, in uh, our own threat assessment. Uh, I would say that we are better because we have institutions, but we are still uh, way behind where we need to be. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with that with that bottom line. I think we are, uh, and I'm I'm a little further away from uh, actual direct service. So this is, but this is my my assessment from the outside, is that uh, we have had a number of 
opportunities to learn and relearn that when uh, there is a threat to human health, that uh, agencies beyond human health agencies have to be a part of the response. And this was one of the key learnings from pandemic preparedness, that there were 14, 16 different departments and agencies that had to be a part of pandemic preparedness. And so I think that recognition alone uh, helps to ensure that in the coordination bodies that we have the right parties around the table at the federal level. Where I become concerned is that you, uh, the interface between uh, the feds and state and locals is going to, the quality of that interface and coordination is going to vary from locality to locality. And you can't test uh, every one of those interfaces against every scenario. And that's where you need to have very strong leadership and have just in time kind of assemblage of uh, this, th these mechanisms of working to, with that particular set of parties at the state and local level uh, in a constructive way that gets a, a response off the ground and, and, and running. And uh, it, that's just a very hard, uh, it's a very tough nut to crack. Thank you. We've uh, come to the hour when the panel's supposed to go and meet. I just want to ask one quick question. One of the interesting things that we've found is that um, w at least we couldn't find a, uh, a biodefense budget for the federal government. Uh, there were a lot of pieces. And we, we actually ended up with an estimate that came uh, from the University of Pittsburgh, from the group that Taro Tool used to uh, uh, run. So, um, that's one of the things we recommended. But um, one, are you surprised? Probably not. Two, uh, does it matter? Uh, I presume it does, but uh, in other words, does it matter? Should there be a somewhere where we see what we're spending? Presumably, if you know everything you're spending, you're gonna avoid overlap, you're gonna spend it more efficiently, et cetera. I, Doctor, would, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll start and I'll just say that I, I would say that that's a symptom of a broader problem, which is a lack of uh, a, a coordination between certain activities in the government that center on biodefense. There are different pockets of these activities. Yeah. There isn't sufficient communication and coordination. And and uh, having a single budget would give you is a first step to cleaning that up. Um, but but this uh, gets into the silo issue that we discussed previously and the right. need, desire of. Uh, many to to make sure that they protect their domain and their budgets and so on sure. and that needs to be overcome That's the ultimate tangible side of it. Yes, sir. So the, I'm always hesitant to use cognates because people are going to groan, but we, we, we heard this uh, As a policy objective for for national intelligence with the creation of the ODNI right that the different intelligence agencies and intelligence agencies within departments uh, had a different, uh, they were an uncoordinated uh, funding stream. I don't know how this has worked, uh, but the idea of consolidating uh, funding over an enterprise certainly makes sense in the business world, and it, it seems to me that it might make sense to have some sort of central budgeting, um, some place where it, where it all gathers. You know, I, I think back to, to uh, the, the pandemic issue of 2005, and there wasn't money to deal with this. And so what happened is all, you, all, uh, you all approved a $7.1 billion supplemental to deal with what, what was determined to be a sufficient uh, uh, Im imminent danger that we needed to do something to get vaccines back into this country and to, to, and to strengthen public health infrastructure. Uh, and that was, you know, that was a, a, you know, presidential leadership and the leadership of, of Secretary Levitt. So it would seem to me to be much better to have a centralized budget authority somewhere. Um, I don't do that sort of work, so I can't really say where, but to your point, uh, Senator Lieberman, it certainly wouldn't make sense. The, the, and, you know, the other th obvious, rather obvious point I would make is that um, the silos partially exist because of the budget lines. So, so you know, when there is a, a project BioShield, with you know, a bunches of billions of dollars uh, to medical countermeasure uh, creation, um, it's it's unlikely that HHS is going to uh, want to share authority over that money because it's in their budget line. It's just it's just the way things are. Um, we saw after Katrina hit that immediately a lot of the resources that had been transferred into DHS were then pulled out of DHS back to their original agencies. So. It's, it's, it's natural human behavior for, for the 
budget lines to determine where these activities sit without an enterprise approach. So, I just want to thank you. You know, <clears throat> post 9-11, when we talked about building a resilient enterprise or a resilient country, we talk about prevent, detect, deter, respond, and recover. You know, those are buzzwords. Everybody's familiar with them. And if you think the progress we've made since 9-11, we have built out pretty decent infrastructure, imperfect as it may be, but far, far improved over the past 15 years to deal with a physical attack, a cyber attack. We're even better prepared to deal with Mother Nature. But the one area, and that's the reason the six members of this panel and the supporting staff are so passionate about this, when it comes to detect, deter, prevent, respond, and recover, if the threat's bio, we're not close to where we need to be as a country. It's a real threat. 9-11 talked about the failure of imagination. You don't need to imagine it. It happened in the modest form. Zika, Ebola, modest, but scale it up, and you know you're not ready. So the fact uh, that you, were, you three have been involved in both security, strategy development and implementation of that strategy been a very helpful panel. Don't be surprised if we knock on your door again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I, I just say amen. Um, it's been, a, to me, a, a, a both very informative day, and uh, if I may say so, <laughs> from the panel's point of view, gratifying, because um, I think, w you know, we and our staff, uh, uh, Dr. Asher George, Dr. Ellen Carlin, and the others, they worked really hard on this report. And uh, it's gratifying to see that it's being taken seriously in the executive branch, in the White House, in Congress, and now with three really experienced people who have been in the field. We, we're not the first to try this. You've all had your hand in different parts of it. Your contribution based on that experience uh, this afternoon is very helpful to us. I mean, we we consider our report to be a living document. It's not, it wasn't etched in stone and uh, we're, we're trying to uh, make it better based on testimony like yours as we go along. So anyone else want to make a final uh, comment? Just to just reiterate exactly that. We're very grateful for the contribution and the leadership you've shown. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good day to everybody. Thanks for being here. <laughs>